Travis Wayne Goodsell. So, John Wick takes out the Elder, takes out the Marquis, takes out, or gets himself out free from the table. The Blood Code. Awesome song. So, the chapter 18, first Nephi, they make it to the Promised Land. They fled Babylon, or Jerusalem technically, <laughs> from Babylon, destroying it. 19, they're now talking about the latter days. So in verse 20, or chapter 20, we start with the very first Isaiah passage. And it's Isaiah 48, uh, about the destruction of Babylon. Has that ever struck anybody as weird? So, to get you guys caught up, <clears throat> the Book of Mormon is written in the learning of the Jews, which means it was specifically written for the latter days. It was not a literal history. There are no such characters as Nephi, Lehi, Laman, Lemuel, Alma. Mosiah, Jesus, because it's the learning of the Jews. The names have meaning, and it's a little difficult because we're unsure of many of the names that are used in the Book of Mormon, and a lot of them came from Charles Anton's reprint of a name dictionary of the ancient world. <laughs> because of the whole Martin Harris thing, he goes, sees Charles Anton, he comes back, says he saw Charles Anton. <clears throat> and so, yeah, they find out that he had recently published that book. Now, this is upsetting the Mormons who demand and insist that their spiritual witness be true, that the Book of Mormon is literal history. Because they read, pondered, prayed, and they got a feeling of warmth and coziness, and believe that's a spirit telling them that the Book of Mormon is literal history. It's not how you obtain knowledge. And it's definitely not how you obtain knowledge according to the Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon says you don't have knowledge. All you got was the seed, the word, and you're doing nothing with it. You're going around demanding that you know exactly what the fruit tastes like. You know, because you got a seed. You haven't planted it, you haven't done anything with it, you haven't grown it into a tree with fruit. So you're lying to everybody, including yourself. Book of Mormon makes it very clear. Just because you read something, just because you're told something, you don't know anything. You can memorize, you know, memorize the seed. Good for you. <laughs> you don't know anything. <clears throat> and so, for those of you who are aware that the Book of Mormon took from other books contemporary with the time period, this shouldn't really surprise you as much, other than I'm the one who made the discovery that it was Joseph Smith Sr. who rewrote the 116 pages here. Because he was the Master Mason in Canandaigua, New York on 9-11-18-26. And that 
as the Master Mason, it was his duty to finish the book that William Morgan was working on with him. Did any of the people you read who claim that the Book of Mormon is plagiarized tell you any of this? Did they not do their research? You know, they only find the late war or, the, or other books, but they didn't reveal the real history that was going on. Yeah, kind of important, kind of essential to your eternal salvation, former Mormons and ex-Mormons and critics. <laughs> and so, yeah, this is senior who's doing this he put this Isaiah passage first and it talks about the destruction of Babylon <laughs> if this were literal history this would be the uh, what the bleep moment. <laughs> and I, you know, if anybody was actually really studying the Book of Mormon, this should catch them off guard. Because Nephi, in his dream, sees the latter days. And then stops, says, referred to John in Revelation for the rest of the story. And then we get to their story of an exodus from Jerusalem from the oncoming onslaught of Babylon and they make it to the promised land and you have a Noah's Ark comparable story which Matthew 24 as in the days of Noah so shall it be in the latter days I didn't quote that I was associated with memory. And, and so in 19, he's talking about the latter days. And here in 20, the destruction of Babylon. Well, in the latter days is the destruction of Babylon, the whore, from Revelation. And section 1, verse 16, to Mormon. They didn't decode this, did they? They said they did for the 1981 edition of the triple. They missed it. So in verse 14, we see Joseph Smith's warning from his 1838 second vision account. That Mormons need to hearken to their Christ, who is the learning of the Jews. Not Jesus. Otherwise, they're going to be cut off. Neither give heed to the voice of the Lord. Shall be cut off from among the people. See, Mormons read this and they go, Oh yeah, Brigham Young to Nelson as the prophets and apostles. Yeah, we need to obey them. No. <laughs> you might as well just put in the community of Christ prophets. You might have been Warren Jeffs. And then you're going, no. And why? Because they have no authority. Exactly. Joseph Smith is writing this. Technically a scribe. And so it's not anybody after Joseph Smith. You're pulling a reverse anachronism. And so who then can stray from ordinances? Who can break the everlasting covenant? Only Mormons. And so it's Mormons who seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness. 
it is Mormons who walk in their own way after the image of their own God. Those who claim to have a seed from God and claim they know. shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the Great, which shall fall, directly from Revelation, which also corresponds with the Book of Mormon, of the great and abominable church. Joseph Smith is telling Mormons that Mormons, he's prophesying here, will be taken hostage in the great and abominable church. They will be in bondage to them. Prophecy fulfilled, right Mormons? Oh, Joseph Smith's not a prophet, but he's still your founder. Even though he's wrong and he's a failed prophet, Brigham still has authority to succeed him as a failed prophet. Even though it's not the quorum or president of the twelve who's supposed to succeed, you didn't know that, did you? Because you're not studying. Section 107, verse 22. So an anachronism is uh, where I'm a fiction writer. And I want to write a new book. And it's about a time period, period piece. Uh, I want to do Mormonism. I want to do a book about the work and the glory. And so it's important to do your research. Because the more accurate I am, with the time period, the better the quality of the book. Now, granted, it's a book and it's subject to aesthetic opinion. You know, your little kindergartner comes home from school with coloring pages and you put them on the refrigerator and say, oh, it's so beautiful. It's all based on opinion. <clears throat> there is no way to judge aesthetics. So likewise with books. There's no way to use a criterion. And once you do, you're cheating. You're trying to make a measurement standard when there are none to be made. You know, but people like to do that so that they can have TV shows about who's got the greatest talents and judge them or beauty pageants so that they can be rigged so that China will allow them to sell their products in their country. <clears throat> All those kinds of contests are ridiculous. In the Oscars, people get very emotionally upset if they don't win or if the person that won isn't who they wanted to win. <sighs> Dear God, it's all just based on opinion of the judges. And they refuse to acknowledge that that's what's going on. You know, they can try to claim that there's certain criteria that they use. <laughs> no. No. And so, if I were to claim that my fiction is literal history, linguistics can now step in to verify or deny if that's the case. They can catch me in a forgery operation here. Similar to Mark Hoffman in the Salamander letter. <clears throat> and one of the things that they look for 
along with the dating of the paper and the ink and stuff that are used is the linguistic pattern. It's a type of fingerprint. And, and so if I were to describe Joseph Smith as wearing tennis shoes, Joseph Smith got up, put on his tennis shoes, went for a morning jog with his MP3 player, listening to his favorite song, The Poor Wayfaring Man of Grief. Everybody should know that's not correct. I'm lying to you. I'm trying to trick you by saying it's a literal history when actually I'm just writing a fiction novel. Because I'm pulling what's called an anachronism. They did not have those inventions back then. And so likewise with the Bible and Isaiah. We can identify when this was written by the anachronisms that are in there. And so, yes, I've helped identify a number of anachronisms in the Book of Mormon. For example, Abinadi gets taken hostage and is interrogated by the priests. And they're quoting the Isaiah passage about how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet who publish peace. Something like that. And he goes, you are the priests and you don't even know your scriptures? <laughs> and then he goes over and quotes the Ten Commandments. Well, there's a problem with that. <laughs> because Abinadi didn't come from the destruction of Babylon. He came from Nephi and Lehi. And their group, even Mulek and their group, merged in all together there. Because he was part of the people of Zenith who left and went back to the city of Nephi to try to reclaim the land. And, and then Noah took over and then chaos ensued. And Abinadi comes to call him to repent or you're going to be destroyed. You need to know that it's Babylon who created a seven-day week calendar. And on the seventh day of the week, it was a day off from labor. Nobody is allowed to work on the seventh day because the Babylonians were extremely superstitious because of their idolatry. And so, the number seven was considered bad luck. Thus came the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Yes, how does the Jews get it? Because that's the Jewish Sabbath on Saturday. It's because they were taken captive into Babylon. They became fully assimilated into Babylon. Everything, their language, their culture, their religion, their rituals, calendar language, whatever I missed, if I missed any, Everything got altered and replaced. And so Paleo-Hebrew went extinct until I deciphered it. And so the, the Book of Mormon not only helps us with identifying it as prophecy and not literal history because of the anachronisms. It's also trying to teach us 
through the anachronisms that we're supposed to catch. That's why he put this first. You're supposed to see that him talking about the destruction he will do his pleasure on Babylon and his arm shall come upon the Chaldeans that they just barely got started when the first year of the reign of King Zedekiah happened they had just barely formed as a capital and had sent their military around to make sure that everybody knew that they were under new management and to give tribute to the new manager and then came in to Judah to expand and put a new king on the throne of Jerusalem that's the context that Joseph Smith senior is trying to get across here because it's a pattern for prophecy of the latter days the beginning of the latter days, the first year. And so, why doesn't Isaiah talk about the impending doom of northern Israel of Assyria? Because that's when Isaiah was around, supposedly. He's supposed to be a prophet to warn the people to be good because there's going to be a new Assyrian nation that will then come in to deport people and bring in what will become the Samaritans. If that's really what a prophet does, uh, what's Isaiah doing talking about Babylon? And what is the Book of Mormon talking about the destruction of Babylon when that has no bearing on the Nephites whatsoever? They left. They fled. They don't need to worry about Babylon being destroyed. Is this a vengeance thing? Because you took Jerusalem, you're going to be destroyed. But we're going to be far, far away across the world. <laughs> yeah, no. He's using this to show that Isaiah is prophesying of the latter days. That this is not literal history. As much as it did happen, there was a Babylon... They did destroy Jerusalem, and they did fall. But when you see it in the Book of Mormon, you see it in the context of the great and abominable church of the latter days, and Mormons being held hostage by them, needing to be freed by their Jewish learning Christ, who would be a Mormon in this great and abominable church to rescue and save them. So it's kind of important to know how to identify the Great and Abominable Church, huh? Kind of important not to let your spiritual witness interfere and tamper with knowledge. Because Great and Abominable Church is real evil. And so, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I have sent him, the Lord thy God, who teacheth thee to profit, who leadeth thee by the way thou shouldst go. Hearken. Because that's all he does in the latter days. He doesn't go around smiting the great and abominable church president. <laughs> I challenge you to a duel. According to the old way, the blood code. No, because we know from prophecy that the leader of the great and abominable church will tell him, no, I will not let the Mormons go. 
The Mormons are my slaves. They're my hostages. I am not letting them go. And prophecy fulfilled. So all he does is speak to you. So that you will go, oh my God, I'm in the great and abominable church. I need to leave Babylon. I need to leave Jerusalem before it's destroyed. I need to leave Babylon before it's destroyed. Symbols of the great and abominable church which falls. And like I've been going over with you, this is the last year of the latter days. The great and abominable church is wrapping things up. They've made their attempts to try to overthrow the government of the United States. Porn was the latest one that I've caught on to. I've been warning about porn all this time, that the church is wrong on it, but to actually get the receipts Flee ye from the Chaldeans, go forth of Babylon. And so, yeah, the, the hymn, O Babylon, O Babylon, we bid thee farewell, we're going to the mountains of Ephraim to dwell. That's kind of wrong. <laughs> yeah, he screwed that one up. But that's what Brigham Young did. He fled from the United States. So he's calling Babylon the United States of America. And that's what I would warn you about all this time, is that the great and abominable church is working with the secret conspirator group to overthrow America. And so the fall of Babylon for them is the United States of America. Not the religion that took it away from Joseph Smith. The bloodline. And so, yeah, a man like Moses led them through the desert of Utah, Judah, Waters flow out of the rock for them, clave into the rock, and the waters gushed out. Yep, that's after the flood. See the flood? Waters part, dry land appears. Well, here, waters crash in again. So the rock is the dry land that rises up. It's the same thing, just different story forms to talk about it. So yes, you missed the exodus, because the waters are back again, at least for a temporary period of time, because our government does not want to do what's necessary to maintain the water. <laughs> Dumbasses. Alrighty, there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Perfect. So I hope you caught it, but I didn't explain it specifically. Isaiah is not literal history either. I think I did mention that. But Isaiah, therefore, also is not real. We find out that it's post-Babylonian captivity. That's why the author is using Babylon to talk about it. And uh, you'd have to do a deep dive into the whole thing. But modern scholars get it all wrong. They're under the pre-assumption of certain things as fact when there is no basis for them as fact. And so they're tainting their investigations and their conclusion theories. They need to get rid of all that. And start all over again with the scientific method. 
unbiased by Christianity or whatever other religious bias they have and they use. And so uh, probably another thing is that uh, Isaiah is the reverse of Jesus. I've said it before, but we'll make it clear here for the series. Isaiah is salvation of Yah. Yah is the Hebrew God from Genesis chapter 1. And then when he completes the creation, he is given the new name of Yahweh. And yeah, I don't care about phonetics. It's the picture spelling that gives the meaning. And so uh, Yah is the same picture spelling as Zeus, the Greek god. And, uh, and so uh, Jesus is Yah of salvation rather than salvation of Yah. And that's why Isaiah prophesying of Emmanuel is used by Matthew to quote him and uh, don't not he doesn't even name him he instead names Emmanuel Jesus in his place so that we understand that I'm Emmanuel is being a fiction story for prophecy of the latter days being the Isaiah prophecy of him so that's in the Book of Mormon as well so, yeah, it's about the latter days. That's what Isaiah is all about.